Go with me to Ezekiel 44. Um, Ezekiel 44. We're going to read four verses here, and then we're going to read four verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. This is what it says here. I had, I had an intro video and all that for you this morning. We're going to skip over that and just get right into the Word, okay? Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. Because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, Therefore have I lifted up mine hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. And they shall not come near unto me, to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations, which they have committed. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house, for all the service thereof, for all that shall be done therein. This month of October, a lot of times folks start thinking about spooky stuff, right? Uh, month of October, we see spooky stuff popping up at Walmarts and, and uh, different places, spooky little masks and little things, and folks start thinking about spooky stuff. I can't think of much spookier stuff than what we just read. Amen? Because what we just read is a passage where God says You're, these, are, these are people that are going to go through the motions but they're never really going to get to that, to that point of, of, of that closeness. Amen? But before I get ahead of myself, go with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Verses 11 through 14 here. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place. For all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. They came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard, and praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Look at this, verse 14. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Pray with me this morning uh, as I speak to you from the subject, Close Encounters of the God Kind. Heavenly Father, I need your strength and your anointing. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would speak through me this morning. I thank you for your direction, God. I thank you, God, that your word is already anointed from the very foundation of the earth. I thank you, God, uh, for the power of your word. I pray now that you would send the power, uh, your power through your spirit to minister through me and to your people. Lord, help us to anoint us to receive the word, to hear, to comprehend, and to apply your word. In Jesus' name, draw us closer to you and give you praise. Amen. So this morning what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to begin a series here. And we'll be in this for the next couple, couple three weeks, uh, thereabouts. Um, but I want to begin this series called Close Encounters of the God Kind. Amen? Um, we have, uh, well, let me, just, let me just ask you this. How many of you understand that there is a, there's a difference between a casual or simple encounter and a close encounter, yeah. right? There, there is a difference between between uh, encountering something casually, just uh, and and really having a close encounter with something or with some someone. And here's where this thought process is coming from. Um, uh, we we sat uh, 
Michelle and I actually went uh, on this Branson trip. Her, she and I went and spent a couple days there. And the one reason we went, uh, it was nice to get away and all that stuff, but we had one uh, actual destination. We went to to see the uh, to the Sight and Sound Theater to see the uh, Moses, the story of Moses portrayed on script, on stage. Uh, Moses has always been one of my absolute favorite uh, Bible characters, and um, and I've shared with you so many times how I just uh, throughout different stages of my life have have just related to the story of Moses and. And God has used that uh, Moses story and example uh, just in, in many ways in my life to speak into my life. Uh, so I, I and it's fixing to close. And I, I was like, I, it can't close without me going to see Moses. And so we went just to see Moses. We were there in Branson and people would ask us, oh, hey, what'd you come to do? Or what are you going to see? And, and whatever. We said, we came for Moses, you know, and that, well, what else did you come for? Nothing. We came for Moses, you know. And uh, but but as, as, as I sat there and and watched this story unfold on stage, uh, probably my favorite thing, I know that they, they build the whole play on the importance of, of, of God parting the Red Sea and all of that. And it was awesome. It was cool to see how they how they depicted that and how they did all of that. But for me, the best scene in the whole thing was Moses in the wilderness and finding that burning bush. And God speaking to Moses and saying, listen, you thought your life was one thing. But I set this bush on fire. To let you know that I'm changing things up. Amen. So many times we get to thinking that, okay, well, there's there's no more than this. And this is all it is. And I mess things up or, 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 or I've taken this direction or that. And this is what my life is now. And there's no changing that. And there's, there's, there's nothing that's going to change that. But let me tell you something. A close encounter with God in an instant can change everything. Amen. Amen. So many times people come into the church and have a casual encounter, a simple encounter whereby our testimony is, you know, as we're leaving church or as we're giving a report of what happened, our testimony as well. We talked about God. We, we, we sang about God. We, we learned about God. We may even go so far as to say that we felt God in that place. Well, I got goosebumps. I got, I got, I got Holy Ghost chills. I got, you know, we talk about those things. But I believe that that the church should be about more than just having a simple, casual encounter with God. Amen. It should be about more than just goose pimples and and and, and you know and and. Uh, you know, just, just hearing a sermon or singing a song or, you know, it's sad when we come into the house of God and, and the thing that we're most excited about as we leave is that, oh, they sang my favorite song this morning. That should not be the thing that you're most excited about. Amen? This should be a place where we come and, and, and we don't just have... A, a casual encounter, a simple encounter, or it can encounter certain things. This should be the place where we come and we and we have a close encounter with God. I believe that the church should be focused on encouraging and fostering an environment where people can have a close encounter. Amen. A real life-changing. Uh, earth shattering, bondage breaking, captive liberating, close encounter with God. You know, we used to sing the old hymns. Uh, just just last week, we had our family reunion. My favorite part of the whole thing, uh, I love the food and the fellowship and all that stuff. Y'all know me. But my favorite thing, we sat around and, and just started singing some of the old hymns. I love the old hymns. And somebody said, well, why don't we sing these in church anymore? For so many people, they don't even know the old hymns anymore. Mm -hmm. And we stopped singing so many of them. 
And I know we can chalk it up to musical preference, and I know we can chalk it up to, to, you know, to all sorts of things, but here's what I really believe, that we've stopped singing so many of the old hymns. Because how are we going to sing? You know, we used to sing songs like, He set me free, and we meant it. And we knew what it was to have been set free, to have been delivered. Amen? We sing songs like he set me free in the church now and you've got folks that were, were, were there then and they understand it, but you've got folks that, if, that, that, that their understanding of the church is a very modern understanding of the church and they don't even know what it is to have been set free because they've never been told that you need to be set free. They've never been told that God is a chain breaker and a way maker, amen? That's right, amen. Sing songs like Amazing Grace. Don't nobody understand. The youngest don't understand about amazing grace. They understand about amazing church programs and amazing picnics and amazing, uh, amazing stage presentations and amazing smoke machines and amazing light shows and amazing this and amazing that, but they don't understand about amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Amen. talk about encounters that we have in church but the church needs to be focused on people having real encounters with a real God that makes real change. Amen? Amen. It's not enough to, to talk about God. It's not enough to, 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 to sing about God. We need to meet him. Amen. To come into his presence and have an encounter with him. And anything less than that is simply not enough, especially in the day and hour that we live in. Amen. And so in this series, I want to deal with the idea that that our goal and our purpose and our true desire, both personally and corporately, should be that we each have a close encounter with God. And not just a, but ongoing close encounters with God. Amen? We want to push into and hold on to, uh, hold on for a close encounter where everything changes. Amen. I was so impressed with that moment. Uh, it's it's always been one of my favorite parts of of, this, of Moses' story, and just watching it on, on on the stage, just just understanding that after everything that Moses had been through, and and after everything that he had seen and experienced, he had experienced the the best that this world had to offer, and he had experienced the uh, the the worst that this world had to offer and torn between the, the, the palace of the Pharaoh and, 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 and the slave yards of his people. And he had seen the best and the worst that this world has to offer. And he had, he had made decisions and, 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 and messed things up and, 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 and felt like it was all over and felt like this is what my life will be until the day that I breathe my last breath. But in just a moment... God showed up and changed everything. That's what the church should be. It's a, it should be the place of the burning bush. Amen? Where people have a real encounter with God that changes everything. As a church... Our thought process should be we don't want to be we don't want you to be able to attend a service and leave feeling like you just left a, 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 a lecture or a business seminar or a, some help self-help session. We want you to come face to face with God. That's the only thing that makes a difference. Amen. So as we open this message this morning, we read two passages of Scripture. 
And each passage describes a, a, a type of church or a, a type of church mentality, their focus, their, uh, the, the way things are, 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 are taking place, the way things are. And the two passages in conjunction here present a challenge. They present a choice to us. And that choice is what kind of church are we going to be? We can be an Ezekiel 44 church where we do the business of God and we go through the motions of church, but we never really come near to him. We can do church and never really have a close encounter or we can refuse to settle for simply running errands and keeping up appearances going through the motions, and we can choose to press on into a 2 Corinthians chapter 5 type of church model, a place where the glory of God, the presence of God, fills the temple to the point that no one can stand. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, I just, I, I, I choose the latter. Amen. I declare that that is the kind of church that, that I want to have, that we, that we want to have, amen? Where everyone experiences His glory. I don't care if you leave the church saying, I really like that preacher, or I think that preacher is, is crazy. I don't care. When you leave this place, you should not be talking about the, your thoughts about the preacher. What should be on your heart and on your mind is, wow, what God did for me today. It's been awesome to be in the presence of God. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's the kind of church that we want to be. Where everyone experiences His glory. But in order to have that, that kind of powerful experience when we come together corporately, we've said this many times, I've told you this many times, we need to be seeking our own close encounter with God personally. Amen? It's not enough just to come on Sunday and say, boy, I really need to get with God. But you didn't need to get with Him Monday. And you didn't feel the need to get with Him Tuesday or Wednesday. Or Thursday or Friday or, or even Saturday. You didn't have no work or nothing you had to worry about. But Saturday was kind of busy too. So, But Sunday, I really need to get with God. And I've said, I've said about two hours aside so I can really get with God and have an encounter that's going to rock my world and change everything. Amen? It's not enough, is it? We need a personal encounter, a fresh encounter. So that brings us to this most important question here. And this is the question we're going to be looking to answer over the next few weeks. How do we have a close encounter with God? What is the process? What are the steps? What are the ingredients that we must combine in order to have this face-to-face, -face, daily, close encounter with a life-changing God? Amen. Close encounters of the God kind. So this morning, let me try to do this real quick. I got, I'm looking at that clock and I'm, I'm seeing about, uh, I'm seeing what time it is. Amen. But I want to give you something you can chew on, you can take with you this morning, okay? I realize some of you may have things you've got to do. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen? But if you miss it, you won't miss it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let me give you this. Let me give you the first part of what I believe are the key elements to having a close encounter. And that is you've got to understand the terms. You've got you to know the terms. Amen. We all want God to draw close to us, but, but the Bible shows us that there are some terms, amen? God said, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. Amen? 
If you want me to take a step in your direction, God says get the step in. Amen? Amen? There are terms. And so we've got to understand the terms. Now, have you ever used the phrase or heard the phrase come to terms? Well, we've come to terms on this or on that. Most of us have, have heard this or used this phrase uh, in, in like business situations or some sort of a negotiation where we're negotiating with another party or another entity. And the comment goes something like this. We met, we talked, and we came to terms. And basically what that means, the connotation here is that, that we each bent a little. We each gave a little. We, we each compromised a little bit, uh, you know, a little give and a little take on both sides, and we finally reached an agreement, right? That's how we come to terms with one another. Amen. I, I believe that the first step in, in, in moving from a casual encounter with God to, to having a close encounter with God is that we must come to terms with Him. But here's the problem. Coming to terms with God doesn't work the same way as coming to terms with your brother or your sister. Amen? It's a completely different thing. Because when you and I are trying to come to terms, there's give and take. There's, there, there's a little compromise here and a little compromise there. But the problem here in, in terms of coming to terms with God, we can't do it the way we've come to understand it. All right? Because it's a different ball game. <laughs> the problem for us and for many is that we're trying to come to terms with God the way that we would come to terms with one another. And that's never going to work. Because God doesn't bend. God doesn't compromise. God doesn't negotiate. God doesn't let us argue or, or, or bend the rules a little here or a little there. In fact, he's very rigid when it comes to the terms or the stipulations that have to be met in order for us to get close to him. Our God does not compromise. And I'm glad about that, aren't you? See, our problem is that most of us have grown up with this like, uh, this like instantaneous mentality, this like this like Burger King uh, type of society, and this Burger King type of uh, mentality that says that, that that we have the right and we should demand to have it our way, right? Oh, have it your way. Look out for you. Look out for number one. Amen. So we carry this mentality over into our relationship with God. And we try to demand that he meets us on our terms. Well, I've got news for you this morning. <laughs> God isn't going to agree to let you have it your way. And that's a good thing. Because when you have it your way, you will mess things up. Amen. When I get my way, I will mess things up. <laughs> Just ask Michelle. Amen. Anybody drive with GPS? I do. I mean, I can get across our town without it, but anywhere else, I need it, y'all. The thing about GPS is, I mean, you know, it'll reroute and try and get you somewhere else. But the best way to drive with GPS is to listen to what the lady has to say. Amen. I call my GPS Helga. I just gave her a name. It's Helga. And uh, my wife's GPS, I gave her a name too. She's Gertrude. I call, so we got Helga and we got Gertie that give the, give the directions when we're, when we're driving. And the thing about it is, the thing about it is, if I don't listen to Helga, 
If I don't listen to Gertie, okay, as I'm driving, and I just think, oh, well, she says to turn here, but I'm just going to go ahead and go on. Or and she said turn right, but I think I'll just turn left. The problem is you start getting, you want to have it your way, right? And you will mess things up. And your GPS will reroute you, but guess what? It's going to take you a lot longer to get where you were supposed to be. Because you had to have it your way. See, the thing about God is, when God talks and God sets the terms, it's not up for negotiation. If God says you need to turn right, you better turn right. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God has specific terms that simply cannot and will not be compromised. And we've got to come into agreement and we've got to come into alignment with them. Now make no mistake here. Okay? It is absolutely, you're like, I don't like that. I like to have things my way. That's great. But save yourself some trouble and listen to God. Okay? It is absolutely for your benefit that you meet his terms. Because his God's benefits far outweigh your burden in meeting his needs. Amen? In meeting his demands. See, God refuses to ignore or to accept our unwillingness to meet on his terms and in his territory. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give in this time because that's just the way so-and-so is. Those are words that have never and will never come out of the mouth of God. Amen. Well, I just compromise a little bit because that's just their personality. That's just their, no. Nah. No, nah, those are words you will, that, that will never come out of God's mouth. Amen. We have to come to God on His terms. And if we don't, He is not obligated to have a close encounter with us. Amen? You want to meet with God. It's not on you. How many of you know that if you wanted to meet with um, the President of the United States or if you wanted to meet with your favorite movie actor or singer or whatever, if you try, you know, if they say, I've got this amount of time, if you're here at this specific time, I can meet with you for 15 or 20 minutes. How many of you know if you don't show up at that time, you're not going to have that encounter. Right? It's not on your terms or on your time. So let me give you a couple of these. Let me see if I can do this in just a few minutes here. Okay. What are the terms? Check these out. Three terms. I'm going to just stick really close to what I've got prepared for you here. There, there are some terms we've got to meet in order to get close to God. First of all, we must be hungry. Write that down. We must be hungry. Some of y'all are thinking, no problem, Pastor. Getting about that time. It's not the kind of hungry I'm talking about. All right? We must be hungry. The very first term or condition that must be met is that we've got to be hungry. God is very clear in stating that those who seek Him, somebody say, seek Him, those who seek him will find him. Amen? Those that hunger and thirst for him will be filled. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We don't have a God problem here, folks. We have an appetite problem. The problem is not that God is nowhere to be found. The problem is we have stopped seeking. Right? God has not hidden himself. We stop looking for him. It's not that God does not want to fill us, that God does not want to bless us, that God does not want to move on our behalf. The problem is that we no longer hunger and thirst after God. So what are you hungry for? Amen. See, everybody has different 
cravings and different desires, right? Like, some folks, some folks, their favorite, if I was to go around to this morning and just say, what's your favorite meal? We'd have a lot of different, somewhat. Some folks will eat a steak over anything. I mean, just give me a steak and some taters and I'm a happy man, you know, whatever. While others would rather have a burrito. Or a chicken salad. A sandwich. Yeah? Preferences, desires, cravings. Amen? Some folks, if we all went out for a steak dinner, you know, even if we all were eating steak dinner, listen, you know, there'd be a whole lot of different requests, wouldn't there? Some want it rare, some want it medium, some want it well done. When Michelle and I go out for a steak, I guarantee we don't order the same one. We never share a plate at a steakhouse, y'all. Because you can't cook half of it bloody and half of it burnt. I don't know that Michelle's ever gone to a steak dinner. She goes to ash dinner. She like, you want to have a steak? Yeah, I can, I can use some charcoal. <laughs> You know? Amen. I like it juicy. She likes it crunchy. Amen. That's how we eat our steaks, y'all. So we never share a plate at a, at a steak restaurant. <laughs> but it comes down to preference. It comes down to your desire, to your craving, what you desire, what you like. Amen. So what are you hungry for? What is that hunger? What is that desire that is that is causing you to seek things other than the face of God and the righteousness of God. Amen? Our appetite is driven by our cravings. We crave all kinds of things. Fame, fortune, success, friends, love, uh, Starbucks. But how many of us really crave God with every fiber of our being? How many of us long for him so, so, so much, so badly that we will do anything and go anywhere to contact him, to touch him, just to spend a minute with him, just to have an encounter with God? Amen? Too many of us are satisfied with less than everything. You know what the problem with that is? When it comes to God, you don't have to be satisfied with anything less than everything because God is everything and more. Cravings will make you do weird things. Amen. Amen. If you don't believe me, just 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 uh, find any any young man whose wife is pregnant. Ask them about their three a.m. trips to the to the grocery store to get peanut butter and pickles and pig's feet. Uh, you know they'll they'll prove the statement for you. Amen. Weird thing. Craving, desire will cause you to do weird things. Like, like standing in line for four or five days to get the newest video game or to see the newest Star Wars movie or to drop a thousand dollars on the new iPhone. Crazy. See, it's cravings, desires, They'll make you get up when everybody else is asleep, when everyone else is overtaken by exhaustion and apathy. Cravings will cause you to get out and to stand in line and to spend money and to expend effort and to take time even when it isn't convenient or comfortable. That's what craving will do for you. So my question is, when was the last time that you so craved God that you were willing to do something crazy if necessary just to have an encounter with Him? When was the last time you were willing to do things that others weren't willing to do in order to get to Him? When was the last time you were willing to get up early to find Him? Uh-oh, preacher. 
Watch that. Don't talk about that. When was the last time you were willing to skip the party? To skip the, 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 the lunch gathering? The, to skip the thing that everyone else was going to in order to get into his presence? How hungry are you? See, because the Bible tells us that you can have as much of God as you're hungry for. God said, if you seek me, you will find me. Amen. It's time to change our appetite and increase our desire for him. Amen. To crave him, to long for him. And if we do, we will find him, the Bible tells us. It kind of reminds you of, uh, puts, puts you in mind of Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. The whole account is... The whole account is a story of this intense, consuming hunger that Jacob has. The story tells us that Jacob wrestles with God and he refuses to let go until he's blessed. Amen. Amen. Can I just, can I just, can I just suggest Some of us may just be giving up just a little too early. It's not that God doesn't want to bless you. It's not that God doesn't have the blessing in store. But it's saying you're not willing to wrestle into the late rounds. Amen? Amen. You're letting go too early. God's looking for, God's looking for some folks who will, who will hold on until you can't hold on anymore. God's looking for some, some folks who are so hungry for a close encounter with him that they refuse to leave, that they refuse to quit, that they refuse to be silent, that they refuse to give up until they get the blessing. I will not let you go until you bless me. Will not let go until they're blessed. They will not let go until they until they get the breakthrough, until they get the answer, until they get the touch that they so desperately need. What are you hungry for? Jacob didn't care what it took. Amen. Mark me if you want to. Cripple me if you have to. Ridicule me if you must. Laugh and shake your head if you will. But I refuse to let you go until I get what I have been promised. My promise is that if I will seek him, I will find him. My promise is if I will pursue him, he will pursue me. My promise is that if I will turn my heart toward him, he will turn his hands and he will turn his face toward me. I refuse to let you go lest you bless me. Are you driven by a passionate, consuming hunger? I'm just going to preach, y'all. If you got to go, go. I, I feel the anointing. I'm going to preach. Amen. I love you if you got to go. You just know that. But I got to preach. We got to be hungry to find God. Amen. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? Somebody ought to just pray right now. God, change my appetite. If my appetite is not you, change my appetite, God. Change my appetite. Change my appetite. Let me move on. We, we, we must be hungry. If we want to have a close encounter with God, we must be hungry. The second thing, we must be honest. We must be honest. This is a hard one. See, the second condition here is that we that, that must be met is that we must be honest. God never deals with us and allows us to remain dishonest. You can't hide anything from God. The Bible says what, 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 what you've done in the dark will be exposed in the light. Amen. In order for us to have a close encounter with God, we've got to become brutally honest about who we are, about who we're not, about what we have, about what we don't have. We've got to be honest. 
Again, if you go back to Genesis 32, you'll see that Jacob, Jacob was hungry. Yes, but he had to meet God on his terms, on God's terms. Before breakthrough could come, before blessing could be given, prior to a close encounter that would change everything for Jacob, including his name and his walk. Jacob had to be honest with God. The angel of the Lord, if you read it, asked Jacob, what's your name? Who are you? And Jacob was honest, and in one statement, he comes clean. He lays it all bare, all, all on the table. I'm Jacob. I'm the trickster. I'm the scammer. I'm the cheater. I'm the... <laughs> His honesty produces this close encounter with God. His honesty produces, gives way to an openness that allows for this, for this close encounter with a life-changing God. Isaiah had to be honest. Amen? He's, he's, about, he's, about, to have, he's about to have a close encounter with God. And, and the Bible says, he says, I, 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 and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. Awesome. We all want that, right? We all want to have this encounter where we see God and, and all his glory and high and lifted up in the temple. And here's what happens. It forces him to meet God on God's terms. And so he cries out, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. He was honest about who he was, amen? He was honest about who he wasn't. Everyone, uh, Everyone might think that I'm the man. Everyone might think that I'm the great prophet. That I glow in the dark because I'm so anointed. But honestly, Isaiah said, I confess that I'm undone. I'm unclean. Amen. Don't you just wish we could be honest? Don't you just despise dishonesty anyway? I mean, how, when one of your kids lies to you, how do you like that? One of your co-workers lies to you, how do you like that? We, you know, I long for the day when, when, when we can be honest in church again. Amen? <coughs> I mean, I can remember growing up, son, I can remember... I can remember Sunday mornings. We'd all be worshiping. We'd all be praising. And someone would walk down the aisle drunk as a skunk on Sunday. Amen. I say they'd walk down the aisle, but, but there wasn't a whole lot of walking going on. It staggered down the aisle. Amen. You knew they needed to be in the presence of God. Amen? They knew something had to change. And they couldn't change it. Demon possessed folks walk into the church. Drunkards, people of poor reputation. Amen? see it in the Bible. We see people come to Jesus and everybody around Jesus said they don't deserve to be in your presence. In fact, they don't even deserve to be in my presence. Jesus said, let them alone. This is where they need to be. And they're more honest before me than any of y'all who are playing like you're, like you're worthy to be in the presence of God. I long for the days when we can be honest in church again. Honest before God again. Amen. I'm so tired. So tired. Aren't you, aren't you just tired of everyone acting like they have it all together in the church house? <laughs> I mean, if you really do have it all together and you got it all figured out, by all means, come take this microphone and you preach to us because I ain't got it figured out yet. 
Amen. Acting like we have it all together. All the while missing a close encounter with God. Because we're unwilling to be honest. Come clean. Amen. Missing out on a close encounter due to dishonesty. Then going home and going to work and falling apart because they miss God. Aren't you tired of that? Amen. I can remember when we really, when we would sing the song and when we would, when we would really mean it to bring your burdens to the Lord and leave them here. Amen. We used to tell them, we used to say that we used to tell them, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Amen. Come to the altar. Bring your burdens to the altar and leave them here. Anymore, we're so afraid that there might be a stain on the altar when somebody gets up. We're so afraid somebody might, amen, we're so afraid. We're so afraid that, that, that folks might, that the service might go a little too long if somebody stays and prays through. We're so afraid that, uh, we're so afraid that somebody might look at it funny or somebody might judge or somebody might this or that that we've forgotten about. Bring your burden to the Lord and, and leave them there. We just we just come in, sing a song, get a sermon, and head on out, eat pizza. Amen. That's not what it's about. I long for the days of honesty to return to the church. We all should. Because it's not just them that are missing close encounters with God. It's you. And it's me. Because we're afraid to be honest. I mean, think about this. Why can a person go to a bar and spill their guts every wrong they have ever done and no one thinks any less of them? Amen. But you can't come to church and come clean because everybody will judge you. That is messed up. That's messed up. God's calling us to honesty, amen? Who are you? Are you undone? Are you messed up? Are you broken? Are you angry? Are you filled with lust? Are you filled with pain? Are you filled with depression, disappointment? Who are you? Who aren't you? Amen. I know you act like you have it all together when you get here, but what is the truth? Who are you? Who aren't you? Amen. What do you have and what don't you have? Honesty before the Lord. We can put on all the shows we want. Put on, put on the show if you want to. Play the part of the actor or actress if you will. But until you lay the mask down and fess up to your issues, amen, your hurts, your needs, you will leave here without a close encounter, without having a close encounter with God. Amen, I don't know. I, I just think, can, can we just... Just amongst ourselves, determine that it's that it's okay to be honest in this place. Amen. Amen. This place will be a safe place where we can honestly and openly deal with our failures, our faults, our temptations, our tendencies, our, our issues. Everybody has them. Amen? I've got plenty for everybody. Determine that this will be a place where we can be honest before the Lord, honest with one another, where we can find healing and victory. Have a close encounter, a life-changing encounter with an almighty healer. Amen? I know I got, I know I got. I would rather, I would rather be honest and open about it and allow God to touch us and change us. Amen. Be open and honest about our faults and our failures than to have to go through what the woman at the well went through, wouldn't you? <laughs> Amen. Her story teaches us that we either come clean. Honestly, 
Or God may just force that honesty upon us. Amen? She said, she said to Jesus, I don't have a husband. What would Jesus say to her? Yeah, you're right. You don't, you don't have, you, you had five. And the one with one you're with now ain't your husband. Amen. You can't you can't hide anything from God. And you might be thinking, well, well, that was kind of rude of Jesus to make her feel bad about herself or to call. I mean, you know, to, I mean, can you just imagine how she felt right there? Drop her head, trembling lips, red in the face, amen. That debilitating embarrassment of having been caught. But that's not what Jesus was up to. What was Jesus up to? What was he doing here? He was exposing the woman's dishonesty so that she would be free to drop the charade. She would be free to take off the mask and have an honest encounter with him. The church should be a place. The church should be that well. A place where we can take off the mask and have an honest encounter with God. Amen? Amen. I'm going to give you this last thing and then I will shut up, I promise. Amen. The last thing you must be in order to have an encounter with God. You must be hungry. You must be honest. You must be holy. We don't talk a whole lot about holiness in church anymore. It's sad, isn't it? We talk about happiness a whole lot. We don't talk about holiness. Amen? But we don't like that, Pastor. Well, you don't get picked. You must be holy. Amen? This third condition, this third stipulation here that has to be met in order to have this close encounter with God, we have got to be holy. In Psalm 24, um, verses 3 and 4, the, 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 the psalmist challenges us here. And he asks this question, who can ascend unto God? Basically what he's saying is, in other words, who can have a close encounter with God? And then he gives the answer. He says, those with clean hands and pure hearts. You must be holy. See, in God's eyes, holiness is not optional. It's not optional. It's a prerequisite. We've taken the idea of everyone working out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Everybody's heard of that, right? But we've taken that idea way too far. There were standards and there were guidelines that we're required to live by, according to God's word. The idea of working out your own salvation is not a license that allows you to decide what's right and what's wrong or what's acceptable. No, God has already determined that. We must be holy. We must live by his guidelines, right? There are absolutes. There are things that cannot be compromised. Amen. There are definite black and white areas in this otherwise gray world. Now understand that what I'm, what I'm not telling you is that you have to be perfect. Because he is in the process of perfecting us. Amen. There's a difference between being holy and being perfect. Amen. You can try all you want to be perfect. But until that day... Until that day that God calls you home, amen, you're going to fall short of that mark. Amen. He is in the process of perfecting us. But as we're being perfected, God says, be holy, even as he is holy. Amen. That's, that's a prerequisite. In fact, if you go back and read... Um, uh, those two accounts that we opened with this, uh, this morning about the church in the Old Testament, you find that holiness is a key component to having God's presence invade your space. 
Amen. Amen. Let me give you let, let, let me give you another example. Let me give you Exodus 40. Exodus 40, verses 30 through 33. If you read that, you'll see that um, it was it was only after Moses and Aaron washed their hands and washed their feet in the labor that they could go into the presence of God. They had to be cleansed. Amen? It was only after that, they, after they had done all of that, that the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Holiness preceded the hovering. Oh, watch over me, God. Be with me. Hover over me, God. Amen. Hover over me. Hover over me. But it was only after they had cleansed themselves. Amen. Holiness preceded the hovering. Okay, I'm going to close up, but I've got to take you back real quick. <laughs> to Second Chronicles, what we read there. Five. It says very clearly that regardless of rank, Regardless of assignment, every priest was consecrated. And then the glory filled the house. Amen. Every priest consecrated. And then the glory filled the house. The holiness, their holiness, their desire for holiness, their willingness to accept and align with the terms. A man made room for God's holiness. Isaiah understood this demand for holiness too, and that's why he cried out, Woe is me! Cleanse me! Cleanse my lips! Amen. Holiness is crucial. Amen. If you if you read the Old Testament and you remember the account of the priest going in. To to uh, into the holy of holies, the Bible says they would tie, uh, uh, they would tie a uh, a scarlet cord on their ankles before they would go into the presence of God. Amen. Because they understood, <laughs> they understood that approaching God is no joke. They understood that. Approaching God takes proper preparation. Amen. They tied it as a reminder that that that, that God is holy. God God wasn't wasn't playing games. He wasn't then, and he's still he's not into playing games, y'all. Amen. He demands holiness. I don't know. Maybe we should start handing out scarlet cords as folks walk into the church. Just just a reminder. Amen. Amen. Or maybe as they're walking out of the church, okay, put your, put your ankle bracelet on. Amen. If you're taking notes, write this down. This is so good. I don't even know where it came from. It didn't come from me at all. But this is so good. Remember, God never alters the robe of righteousness to fit man. God alters, changes the man to fit the robe. Amen. You must be holy. Well, pastor, I can't help. I can't help the words I use. It's just a habit. Okay, okay, okay. Well, God, I, I, you know me. I just can't help. I just can't help the words that I use. It's just, it's just I grew up with them, and it's just a habit. All right, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I... Let me just let me just alter this for you. No, that's not how God works, is it? God says bitter water and sweet water can't come from the same well. I remember one time my my, my cousin Mike and and uh, well Mike loves to tell the story, but sometimes when Mike and Steve and myself are together, we'll talk about things that happen. And, and Mike loves to tell the story of a lady who came up to my granddad during the service one time and said, Pastor, pray for me. I cuss. Amen. <laughs> I cuss. And we giggle about it. But you know what? It's, it's awesome that she was honest enough to come and say, listen, this is my struggle. 
Amen. I want to be holy. I want to be better. Amen. Amen. Well, it's just the way I talk. Well, quit it. Because it ain't the way God talks. It amazes me. It amazes me how you'll talk that mess to everybody. You'll cuss anybody and everybody out. But when you got a need, you don't go to God with them words. Amen. Well, 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 God, I just can't help the thoughts I have. I just, I just have a naturally dirty mind. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll, just, I'll just give you a dirty mind pass. No, that's not the way God works, is it? God says, do not be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Whether it's a dirty mind or a clean mind or a crazy mind, be transformed. Amen. We want it to get easier, don't we? We, we want to continue to be, so many want to continue to be bottle fed. But God expects us to grow up and get off the milk and onto the meat so that we can grow and we can fill out into righteousness. Amen? God will never lower his standards. Quit looking for it. Quit asking for it. Quit hoping for it. God will never lower his standards or change his terms. He will require holiness out of us if we want his presence. In conclusion, I have these. I told you I was getting here. I finally did. Uh, I want to challenge you this morning. And myself as well. Do you really want to have a close encounter with God? That's the question. What are you hungry for? What's your appetite? Do you really want a close encounter? Because we all talk about it. How we long to be in the presence of God. Just as long as I don't got to change. And just as long as I don't got to give up anything. And just as long as I don't got, I know that's bad English. But you know what I'm getting at. Ain't got to know something better. And those are the only two I can come up with. You really want to have an encounter with God. And if your answer is yes, then you've got to become hungry. Your appetite has to change. Amen? Your appetite has to change. If you want to have contact with God, then you've got to be brutally honest with yourself, with those around you. Amen? I really don't like, I'll just be honest, there are some parts of this that I don't like very much. One of them is confess your faults one to another. I don't like that. I don't. Hey Amen. It's one thing to let it's one thing to confess them to God because He already knows. Hey Amen. I don't like it, but it's in there. If you desire more than you've ever experienced before. Got to approach God consecrated and holy. Amen. We've got to deal with sin. We've got to deal with wickedness in order to make room for the growth and the change that will take place as we experience these close encounters of the God kind. We've got to be humble. You gotta be honest. You gotta be holy. Amen. Bye, God's with you. Bye, Gates.